last part of today's investigations, philosophical and otherwise. Our next speaker is Michael Shanks, who is an archaeologist at Stanford University. He grew up in the north of England, read uh, archaeology, anthropology, and classics at Cambridge, and later worked at the Sorbonne, Gothenburg University in Sweden, Lampeter in Wales, Durham in the UK, and University College uh, Dublin. Uh, he is a classical archaeologist by training, has written a great deal on um, archaic Greece. His books uh, with Tilly, the Shanks and Tilly books of the late 80s, were part of the revival of a kind of incisive theoretical form of inquiry in archaeology, breaking through uh, some of the um, ossified, to use a word of the morning, patterns of thought in archaeology from the previous decades. Um, his work with theater, with the idea of imagination in archaeology, all suggests the ways in which the study of artifacts in a historical way needs to be informed by imagination, and imagination in turn can be nurtured and staged in a variety of contexts, many of which not traditionally associated with uh, archaeology. He has, for instance, investigated the design of beer cans, uh, as well as ancient Greek and alongside of ancient Greek perfume jars. He's worked on prehistoric landscapes. He's currently digging a, a large site in Binchester, south of Durham, uh, looking at the relationship between uh, the Roman garrison town and the surrounding, we might think, of suburban uh, private context as the largest bath, uh, bath complex in northern Europe. Uh, he currently writes a design column for the Boymans van Boeningen Museum in the Netherlands. At Stanford, he was the director of the Stanford Humanities Lab, along with Jeffrey Schnapp, and is now a senior faculty member at the Hasso Plattner Institute of Design, Stanford's D School, where he works on the intersection of history and memory in the role of design seen historically. Uh, and uh, it's from that perspective that he became involved in and is now a director of the REVS program, which studies the history of the automobile in the United States with one angle connecting it to contemporary car design and in another angle looking at automobiles as vehicles of materialized memory, much as uh, an archaeologist of a different sort might do only with remains dug out of the ground. So it's a great pleasure to bring him here to speak to us uh, about a subject deeply related to the question of research, and that is the impact of research on the researcher, and in particular, is research a way of life? Michael Shanks, welcome. Thank you, Peter. It is um, uh, great to be here um, with this fabulous set of topics that, yes, go, um, as Peter is rightly suggesting, deep into the heart, really, of who we see ourselves as, how we define ourselves through what we do. Um, I'm going to kind of walk you through some connections that I would never have anticipated I would make um, when I set out to be an archaeologist, um, well, a little bit too long ago now to care to remember. Um, uh, so some connections that have happened to me, kind of thing, in the course of uh, uh, this career. And they're between, um, yeah, what is at the heart, of course, of our academic lives, and should be, research. Um, but how we configure that, how we see that, how we operate that, and the two fields that I've... Um, uh, bumped into almost our performance, performance art, and um, design, design practice. And I'll try and pull some connections together. First, though, I just need to orient you um, uh, to you know, help really understand how I came to make these connections. Um, and it goes um, back to when I was a grumpy, angry young man and um, really quite dissatisfied with archaeology as it was being presented to me. It was being presented to me as kind of, it was body of knowledge kind of stuff that I was getting. And instead, I was fascinated, as I think a lot of us are, by the process. Archaeology working on what is left of the past. And I've kind of pushed this um, uh, definition of archaeology very, very hard all the way through my uh, work, that archaeology, archaeologists don't discover the past. Archaeologists um, work on what's left of the past. 
Um, and this has meant that my angle on archaeology has been, yes, um, practice-oriented, but because, and we've heard a lot about this today, actually, it's rather wonderful, it's the materiality of the past, it, the things. But, of course, that always suggests immaterialities and cultural aspects. Archaeology itself, not just as digging into cultures, what's left, but also archaeology itself as a mode of cultural production, because we work on what remains to produce things. They may be academic papers. They also may be, of course, museum exhibitions. Um, and in this uh, melange, which is archaeology, archaeology working with remains, thinking about them, exploring the tangibles and intangibles, um, I've been faced, yeah, with what I see now as hybrid assemblages. Assemblage is a classic archaeological concept. It's a beautiful one goes right back into the 18th century. The notion of assemblage as bringing things together, collecting indeed, uh, and things and people. Their intimate entanglement, um, their hybrids. Um, another angle, that, uh, another aspect of archaeology that um, is so central uh, to our work, you can't avoid it, which is that archaeology has never been primarily an academic discipline. Indeed, it did find one of its uh, homes in the museum of the 19th century. But before that, um, there is a, a genealogical sequence track that we can go, that we can follow back, where archaeology has always been so much more um, than academic pursuit, or indeed knowledge pursuit, or indeed research pursuit. Um, nowadays, um, perhaps we're uh, more uh, accustomed to thinking of, indeed, after uh, the, the um, uh, critical theory of the 1930s um, and notions of culture industry, archaeology is at the heart of the heritage industry. And looking at archaeology's place in cultural resource management, as it typically gets called in the United States, and which indeed encompasses um, uh, the work of the museologist and the curator, um, you have to take into account the um, discursive structures of heritage. What makes it possible in terms of political economy? Um, who gets to par participate? Who gets access? Uh, how that, um, uh, how working and being allowed to work on remains of the past, having access to memory and material culture from the past is fundamental to senses of who you are, identity issues. Um, manifestation and engagement, being able to connect with the past and how the past is made manifest or not in your life. Um, I was, as I say, I'm going to connect the um, archaeology with performance and design. Um, and the way it's kind of going to work or has worked for me um, is, <laughs> uh, well, we heard this morning about, and we, we keep hearing about these, and I kind of like the notion that we have a turn this way, and then we have a turn that way. And I remember the linguistic term in Cambridge in the 1970s. It was very exciting because people were getting, were being refused jobs and people were shouting at each other in seminars over this kind of thing. And it's kind of lapsed a bit, you know. And yeah, but, but the latest one, of course, is there's a material turn or a tangible turn. And I, do, I kind of like this. Um, uh, on the other hand, I'm going to call it a turn to practice. It's not really. It's just um, uh, to use that, um, that, that, that rhetoric, really. Um, but, but it is seriously a component of how, as I say, I look at archaeology. But here I just want to flag up a couple of concepts that um, uh, should be familiar to us uh, with our social science hats on. Um, political economy, I've said it a few times already, not just in this talk, but yesterday too, um, in a talk yesterday and indeed this morning. Um, agency, uh, our ability to get things done, to work on things. Um, work and making things. Already, you can perhaps sense a connection with the field of design. And I'm not just talking about design history and studying design, design research, but actually archaeology as a field of design itself, working on what remains of the past, indeed designing the past. Um, so archaeology and performance, let me just uh, uh, get going. Um, a little anecdote. It's back in 1993. And um, I was um, a lecturer, a new faculty member in uh, the Department of Archaeology at Lampeter, which was a fringe, and a beautiful fringe, because it meant that we could do what we wanted, and nobody really take very much, took very much notice. And um, uh, however somebody did, I got a phone call um, from a, a certain Mike Pearson, 
um, saying uh, he wanted to come and visit me. He'd uh, seen some work I'd been doing and um, uh, had something to show me. Mike turned up at my office door. Oh boy, he's, he's, Mike is about this big. He's significantly taller than me and he's, 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 he's big, he's like this. And at the time, um, Mike uh, was running a um, performance company called Brief Gove. And they, 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 they had a kind of uniform and it was incredibly intimidating. Um, Mike, Mike looked like, you're an audience who will get my movie references. My students in Stanford have never watched any movie I've ever watched, nor any TV series. And so it's, it's just impossible. However, you, I know, some of you certainly will know um, Nosferatu with Max Schreck. Mike looked like Max Schreck. He was up here, bought shaved head. He's got big ears, Mike, you know, big ears like it. And a uh, black leather coat buttoned up here all the way down to the floor. And, and he said, uh, but he's, he's very gentle and, and, and very mild-mannered. And he, he, he had a VHS video. Oh, my God, those are from an old day. In his hand. And he says, I want to show you this video. So we went around the corner um, to our lab and put it in the machine. And he, he ran a video. And you're seeing part of it here now. This is 1993. The video the next year, oh, it didn't win a BAFTA, but it got nominated because of this kind of stuff, the camera work. Um, it used a camera that was tracking across a ceiling in a room and out the windows, indeed, of a room um, where things are happening. On top of which, you can see there are screens within screens. Um, there is a soundtrack, multi-layered soundtrack, but I won't disturb you with that. And you, here we go. We get uh, screens coming over and words going each way. It's Welsh and English and includes also references, uh, well... Um, you can make them what you want, really. I won't uh, uh, dig into them, but Yuri Gagarin is in there somewhere. Um, but um, Mike ran this for 20 minutes, uh, stopped it, and I, I you know, yes, okay. And he said, um, well, what did you think? What did you think? I said, very interesting. Nice camera work. Very good, very good. Yes, yes. And then he said, he said, huh. He said, oh. He said, I brought this uh, because um, uh, of the theater company, uh, which I helped direct. Uh, and we've had a chat about you. I said, oh, yeah. And um, he said, we think that this is what you do. The video, right? And I said, what? That started a conversation um, that we're still having, actually. And Mike and I have just, uh, we've had a kind of sabbatical of 10 years. And we've started working again. Um, but what was the connection? It took a little while to figure it out. They, they were ahead of me, they were way ahead of me. Um, uh, it, this was my peers and Cliff McLucas was the other um, art director who actually did the, um, uh, the, the direction of this um, video. Um, the, what they were doing in that little video was exploring um, a, a, a whole series of issues really about life in West Wales and the history of West Wales, its culture, its language. Fundamentally though, they were asking a very simple question. What do you do with memories and remains in uh, an internally colonized um, principality? It's not even considered a country in the United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Um, uh, what do you do with um, cultural memory, personal memory, in a world such as that? Um, and what they were exploring were modes of gathering, assembling, uh, traces, evidences, memories, sorting them, arranging them, and then moving into storytelling mode. How do you work with such fragments, for example, in video or indeed live performance? And um, uh, the corollaries were all there too, of forgetting, of losing, omitting, of decay, of course, loss, and indeed destruction. And a lot of... Um, um, the history of the principality has been quite actively destroyed and is omitted from official record. So they were getting into the personal politics of cultural memory. That was the connection that they saw that I didn't get for a little while. Um, so Mike and I um, started really a, a, a joint work, collaborative work, um, where we, we talked, yes, and shared um, uh, um, thoughts and work. We joint authored, but we also started um, uh, doing stuff together, for, which involved visiting places, and in particular, one place, um, this one. Um, it's a, a ruin in a forest, um, and it had been uh, uh, 
brought to ruin because the um, British government compulsorily purchased the whole landscape and moved everybody off. Another uh, clearance, it was a Highland clearance, as it happened in Scotland in the 18th century, but this was in 20th century Wales. Um, and we, were, we asked a simple question. What do you do when you visit a site, a site such as this? That was our case study. Um, and we were interested in those verbs that go with that. We're interested in being transitive. Um, to anticipate, you know, you, you know, you're going somewhere, what's going to happen? Observe, to engage, intervene. We heard about intervention as a mode of artistic practice this morning. Absolutely. What do you do when you're there? Do you just passively take it in? Or you can, of course, intervene. And, of course, a whole genre of land and environmental art, contemporary art, has explored this at wonderful um, length. Um, you can record, document, represent, collect, gather, absolutely, and then report, share, take it somewhere else. You can displace bits of the site. Um, and indeed, also, uh, we were facing the issue of advocacy. Who do you tell about what with sites like this? Some of it involved, um, uh, a, a, a can temporary art genre that Mike has become very, very identified with, which is site-specific performance. Things that happen in a performative mode outside of a theater. And here we are doing a, um, a guided uh, tourist tour of sorts, except Mike is getting into horrible things about death and all sorts. Um, and uh, we also um, staged um, things on site. Um, as a kind of cultural probe, I love this notion, Marshall McLuhan's notion of a cultural probe, where you do, you know, what do you do with a probe? You poke somebody and see what happens. <laughs> well, we were doing that with a site. We would do things on site and see what the audience reaction was or see what was possible. And here we've built, um, <laughs> under the uh, influence, the inspiration of Bernard Chumi, a rather fascinating architect, some uh, scaffolding cubes running through this site in the Welsh forest um, at which we staged events. Um, this, um, over three nights, was essentially a piece of um, site-specific performance art um, and it involved a very stinky dead sheep. The, um, it, it was very deliberate. The, uh, uh, you can't now um, slaughter sheep outside of an abattoir we had the farmer who, he didn't live on this site, but he knew um, uh, the last inhabitant of this particular ruin who was shipped out in 1942. And um, Dai, who was the farmer, used to slaughter all his own sheep. Uh, the state won't let him do that now because they claim his knowledge is irrelevant and unhygienic. Um, so we wanted him, we were going to get him to slaughter a sheep on site. We don't encounter this in our daily lives now, do we? Um, but we couldn't, and so we pickled it in formaldehyde instead. Um, other things happening, we were interested in the relationship of place and event. Um, something else um, that involved uh, working on remains of the past in a performative mode, this time archival. Um, we had, at Stanford, um, acquired... Um, the uh, archive of a rather fascinating San Francisco-based artist called Lynn Hirschman. And um, um, uh, Stanford Library, very interestingly, is getting into purchasing collections of all sorts of things. Uh, we want them at the moment to buy a collection of cars. There's a great question. Can you have a car collection in a, in a library? Anyway, um, uh, in this case, uh, we had Lynn's uh, archive, and we uh, asked the question, for one particular work she did in 1972, uh, with Eleanor Coppola, which was um, uh, essentially it was a piece of uh, installation art in a hotel room in San Francisco. It was there for three weeks. It looked like a, sign, a crime scene, and the police um, uh, took it all off, the, off Lynn and the, um, the hotel, and it never appeared again apart from a few bits and pieces which we'd got our hands on. Uh, the question was, what do you do with such an archive? And we said, maybe we can reanimate it. Maybe we can, in this case, in a virtual world, saying life, um, we can rebuild the hotel. Um, but what do you, how do you rebuild it? Um, we could, we did, we got all the evidence we could. We could have imagined the way it might be. Instead, we took the evidence and built what we could with the evidence. And it looks nothing like a hotel, but it's as close as you're going to get, and it is completely empirically accurate. Um, 
but here we're trying 3D extrusion from 2D photographs. And you can walk up them. You can walk into a photograph. Isn't that cool? Um, so we were, we were looking at how you reanimate bits of the past as real-time event, which, of course, is one of the generic things we're doing in the museum. And in so doing, given that we're exploring here performance art, contemporary performance art, its relationship indeed to such things as reenactment, and here, um, you know, it's not a gaming environment, it's a 3D world you can hang out in. And what do you do there in the way of reanimating the past? All of this amounted to what we um, came to call theater archaeology, defined as the rearticulation of fragments of the past as real-time event with a focus on performance, um, in a, admittedly, under a loose definition. Performance as a doing and a thing done, that is, pursuit and event. A performance as a field of rhetoric. This is fundamental. We've had reference to it today um, again already. Um, in this case, you know, forensic rhetoric, taking fragments and making a case out of them to be presented to an audience in a form of advocacy, of what, under what conditions. So it's about um, a set of practices that, of course, uh, long and uh, dear uh, to the Western city-state. Um, performance as dramaturgy, um, scenography, inscription, indeed, fundamentally is a, 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 a kind of project design. Um, the company that I ended up working with, uh, with Mike, was called Brief Gove, as I mentioned. And I joined the board of directors in 1997, thereabouts. And um, uh, we, I joined a, a, deliberately as an academic at a time when arts funding in the United Kingdom was under serious um, threat. And indeed, the threats were carried out and the cuts um, fell, particularly on um, uh, arts um, subsidy outside of uh, the big cities, well, outside of London. And um, uh, we were concerned, therefore, about how the company was going to be um, feasible. And so we looked to find ways of striking up alliances with the academy. Um, and one of the projects that we followed was the notion that arts practice can constitute itself as research. This goes way back, actually. In the 1960s, um, there are a bunch of um, arts movements, indeed, as well as individuals, who um, uh, saw their work as research practice. Grotowski, the great physical uh, theater uh, performer, um, certainly saw his work as being part of a laboratory. And there were laboratory theaters all over the UK, and indeed Northern Europe, um, from those times. What we were essentially doing was saying, we can have Mike, who's currently an art director of a theatre company, as a professor of performance, even though he's never written an academic book. Um, and you can apply that also to novelists, perhaps. The, the argument, therefore, the, that argument, that advocacy, that case we were making, involved us um, arguing about what arts practice might be, indeed in relationship to how we understood research. Now, you know, it depends whether, of course, you're in the science, the social sciences, humanities. And humanities have been very fuzzy, as we've heard, about how you define humanities research. And what we said was, look, there, is, there are certain components we would all accept as being part of research. And they include a certain kind of attitude of seriousness. That's the orientation. Um, a focus, indeed, on originality, um, not plagiarism. Um, a process. Process is important. Rigor. Uh, protocols, you follow certain accepted um, uh, uh, procedures. Uh, transparency, which means sharing your work, publishing your work, not hiding behind, um, uh, 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 putting things out in the open. And of course, peer community. In a world of discursive infrastructures, that's why you know, Foucauldian shorthand, meaning you know, that academics do research in universities that have funding, that comes from dot, dot, dot. And they have libraries and buildings and things like lecture rooms where, well, are they theatres? Can you do theatre in a lecture room? Yes, of course. Um, and, if, and above all, also, critical apparatus. So if we said, if we can tick off every one of them, surely um, this kind of arts practice uh, is a candidate for research. Um, and we also made arguments like, OK, fieldwork is um, a form of staging project management that involves staging 
It involves absolutely a scenography um, and involves a whole series of um, uh, uh, procedures and techniques that come out, well, that are shared with the art world. And this is uh, the site that um, uh, Peter just mentioned in the north of England uh, that I'm busy digging. Um, but I can't dig it on my own. There's another one, collaboration. The peer community, how do you constitute it? Um, we were also starting to really take on board, not starting, we, we, my disgruntlement with archaeology in the 1970s had been a lot in, uh, coming out of um, science studies, which was questioning the value freedom of the likes of archaeological pursuits, where archaeologists thought that if they dug up facts, that meant um, uh, they were being value free and neutral. Um, and we were you know, trying to convince people that that was so naive, it was untrue. Um, and so in the wake of Kuhn and Foucault, and then with the great wave of um, ethnographic studies of sciences um, uh, uh, coming after that research into science, um, we were, uh, well, an anecdote. Um, we study in what exactly happens in archaeological research, fieldwork and all the rest. Now, our textbooks tell us. Um, they list all the different methods that archaeologists use, and they're all over the place. Yes, genetics, as well as um, geophysical prospection. Um, but when I went to Stanford, I was kind of, oh, what was it? People started coming to visit me, because Stanford's at the west, and it's at the edge of things, and an archaeologist shouldn't be there, and so they were taking pity on me and coming to visit me. How can you possibly? You must be dreaming of the Romans, Michael. There are no Romans in California. <laughs> and, of course, you know, the... the the, you, know, you know, the sad story, of course, of California is that, that, you know, it's a sad story of genocide and Native Americans not exactly getting a very good deal. Um, and so I uh, got a lot of visitors. And with a friend of mine who's second uh, uh, down from the top there um, on the right, Bill Rathjay. Bill was one of the, the great larger-than-life figures of archaeology who moved to California on retirement and started hanging out in the department that we were creating. And I got to know Bill. And Bill said... You know, they, they, we'll get people over and we'll talk to them. Um, we, we'll, and he'd done a seminar in uh, Harvard way back when. And, um, and, and so we started interviewing archaeologists. Um, and it got quite serious in the sense that, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a double act, good cop, bad cop. Or maybe it was the bottles of wine we used to ply people with. Um, but we got people to really open up about what their lives had been like in archaeology. And we put them all together eventually. It was 10 years of work. And we put them all together eventually in this book here called Archaeology in the Making. And the key thing that had dawned on us quite, quite early on, actually, and the reason why we were spending so much energy in uh, uh, the, this effort and uh, transcription and then editing and then providing a suitable uh, editorial uh, framework um, was that we found out something that actually you would imagine was, of course, the case, but was really brought home to us hard. And that was that the textbooks were, gave you no idea whatsoever as to what archaeology was really about. Um, because the practice of archaeology was different from how it had been formalized. Um, just in the same way as philosophy of science does not give you a good guide to how to be a lab scientist or indeed how to get funding, in the same way the descriptions we had of archaeology left out the human component. That is, the people who do the archaeology. And so we got fabulous insight into how archaeology was working as a practice, and indeed, of course, within that, how research was working. And what it really, as I say, the key in, in all of this for me was the human factor. Because I started making connections with this, how we were getting insight into, if you see archaeology as um, cultural production, this is human, the human factor in cultural production, which involves, yes, a question of method, but also I'm going to head on to this method as actually, well, what is it? And how does it relate to this field of what I'm going to be calling in a moment design? But let me just take you through that from design. The question of method. And um, we get a whole load of methods in archaeology. Um, and you can learn how to do them, but again, you know, book learning doesn't necessarily uh, give you the know-how. However, my encounter with Bill and these uh, uh, archaeologists um, uh, got us to just question at all whether method was what archaeology was about. It involves methods, but that doesn't tell you what to do when you're faced with a field in the north of England that you know has got a Roman town under it. Where do you start? What do you do? You know how to dig. Where do you dig? Why? Where do you get the funding from? And is that what it's really just all about? How does it work? So um, 
uh, we started looking really less at method and more at pragmatics. And being a classicist, because uh, it's the classics department at Stanford that pay my salary, um, I've got to kind of you know, justify that. So I use Latin and Greek words a lot. And uh, <laughs> forgive me, I shouldn't be so uh, naughty here. Um, but pragma and pragmata, the plural in, in Greek, is a beautiful word. Of course, it's the basis for our pragmatics. Um, but it's, it's a beautiful word because a pragma in Greek is both a thing and a thing in the Heideggerian sense um, as, you know, the gathering, the assembly. Okay. It's a thing as well as a doing. And so pragmata can be both things as well as things done. Um, and you can therefore kind of say, right, it's the issue of a site to be dug is a question of what are you going to do? What things are going to have to be done? Event and pursuit, as in a performance sense. How are you going to operationalize this? How are you going to design that engagement with the past? That requires a pragmatology. What are the principles, pragmatic principles, of engagement with a site, with these things? It requires a pragmatographia, which, of course, includes documentation, record, um, cartography, or ichnography, which is another wonderful Greek word, um, which is planning and um, uh, elevations, architectural drawing, and a pragmatogeny. This is a favorite of Michel Serre, an investigation into the origins of things. Where did the things that you do come from? Um, I mentioned that performance, and Mike had argued this, and a good deal of performance theorists had argued that performance is a mode of project design. Um, in putting on a piece of performance, absolutely, it's a design challenge. Um, Stanford, the other great lucky um, uh, thing that happened to me, again, accidentally, as I say, was that I um, fell in with the design crowd. There's a lot of them at Stanford. And um, uh, uh, this connection between cultural production and design um, was not a difficult one to make, given the open community um, of designers uh, at Stanford, as I say. Um, and what I was, uh, I started teaching with them, and um, we do collaborative team teaching in the D School at Stanford, uh, which means, boy, you learn quick, and because uh, uh, you have to. But it's, anyway, I won't say much more about the ethos, which is very friendly, it's very welcome and warm, so it's easy to learn. Um, what became clear very early on was that uh, the, the mission at Stanford, the D School, um, which uh, is relatively young, uh, but has deep roots in the design community of the Bay Area, um, it was clear that, that um, there was a process at the heart of um, uh, the mission of the D School, which was rather difficult to communicate, because it was not about methods. It was clear to me from early on that it was a pragmatics in the same way as I'd been exploring. Um, yes, with archaeology as science studies, what, what's the praxis? as well as performance. What do you do to put on a performance at a site, um, such as uh, Esgav Reith, which you saw a moment ago? Um, and the D School emphasizes, and indeed with its industrial affiliates, which include, we heard the mention of IDEO this morning, uh, they're one of our major uh, partners. Um, it includes the, the whole way of organizing and running a studio or a lab, a laboratorium. It involves collaboration because you can't do it on your own. And fundamentally, this pragmatics is not about r rigorous procedures. If you follow rigorous procedures, you'll fail. It's not open to simple algorithms, or indeed complex algorithms. It's a pragmatics that requires improvisation. How are you going to make this product for this purpose such that it comes within business viability, you've got the money, and it's actually technically possible? Um, those questions are not easily, you can't. Um, uh, 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 presuppose them. It's about improvisation and pragmatics. Design them as a process. Indeed, design, because of these commonalities, as performance. Um, they call it, and it's difficult, design thinking. That's my colleagues. I kind of shy away from it, but that's the, the, um, uh, the, the, the way it's described. It's a, not a thinking. It's a process. It's project-based. Um, we work on projects. It is post-disciplinary as I'm going to describe and end with. And it's all about how we work with things in teams, a process that pulls together projects, 
aims, dreams, people, clients, experts of all sorts of different kinds. How do you manage that process? It's a multidisciplinary process. I'm calling it post-disciplinary because the disciplines kind of dissolve. Um, okay, so here is the, uh, the D school. Um, uh, it's process, and these are the, oh, we like drawing diagrams a lot. Um, I've actually, uh, my particular part in it involves automobiles. Um, uh, Peter mentioned it at the beginning. I've another accident waiting to happen as well, um, which is uh, here we've got a rather wonderful 1913 Persia, which we're researching. We have a car collection. <laughs> we even have a car museum. Here it is. Um, our aim in this particular design case study is to bring together the past, the present, the future of the automobile and its design through the practices that we've been sharing today. Um, and it is the future. This is uh, Masato Inoue, uh, who designed the Nissan Leaf, and this is one of the Nissan uh, concept cars uh, for the future. And um, uh, he's a designer who I've interviewed in the same way as we kind of interviewed our archaeologists to find out how they work. Because we have a process. Um, and this is what I'm going to end with. What is research? I'm kind of making connections with research as we understand it. It's not, um, this is not a zero-sum game. I'm not saying that you know, uh, what we do as research is not research and that there's another form of research that we could follow. No, 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 no. It's about understanding more. It's about filling this gap that Peter opened with this afternoon. Um, you know, so what is it? And in the D school, we're all about pro process. How does it work? Here are just some of the sequences that we flag up, for each one of which we have um, different m m modi operandi, ways of operating, pragmatics. But here's the, the question that we've been facing all afternoon, and I'll put in front of you, which is how do you do multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary work across institutions? The design world is, has had to deal with this for many, many years. Um, and has worked out ways of delivering goods um, in such an environment. I would make the claim that their process is coincident. It includes, it subsumes a research process that we all recognize. Um, it is about project management, but more, because it's flexible, it's pragmatic, it's improvisatory, it is performative, site-specific, and all the rest. The T on the left here is what the business community pick up on. How do you combine analytical thinking, that is material science, detailed knowledge of conservation, whatever it might be, how do you combine such detailed knowledge with other kinds of knowledge that you need to realize your project? If you're doing a healthcare product, you may need some very specialist knowledge about instrumentation, as well as medicine, as well as biotech, as well as genetics. How do you combine those interests? The same as an archeological challenge on a site that what we're offering is a process which gets called design thinking um, as a way through that. But it's, that's too shorthand for me. I don't think it fits. This is, and I'll just very quickly take you through it as an end pro way, way of doing it. Here are specialized expertise digging into, well, what? Typically, we start off with a problem in research, or we may have a design brief. Do that exhibition by next week. <laughs> Or a challenge. We want to do something. We've set ourselves a challenge which may be quite indefinite. How do you approach that? We've seen this morning, for example, of Paola sharing with us um, a way of dealing with exhibitions, which is about thematics. Absolutely. You can pick issues which connect these. The problem, the design brief, can connect your different specialized expertise, as can your own definition of um, a, an articulating theme or an issue. So we saw how that's one way of connecting. But how do you... Do it in terms of methodologies and pragmatics. That's what's up at the top. Theory works because it gives you a, a, a transferable conceptual apparatus that lets you connect different things. I can connect archaeology with theater, with design, through a concept of agency, for example, which comes out of social theory. Um, but the other two are first prototyping, iteration, make stuff, Project-based, get everybody together, get them to make stuff and see what happens. Learn from that process of improvisation, of prototyping. And they're the core of what we practice in the D School as a design process. I'll leave out the stuff at the top there. What we're really saying is that there's a way of combining 
the challenge, the different components of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, postdisciplinary research. You don't have to give up on the detailed research expertise to realize these projects in the real world. And the proof is cars and the design world and the amazing things that 20th century industrial design has done because it just didn't voice these kinds of processes when it was working. So that's my little story. Um, thank you very much, and I hope it uh, kind of added a little bit more to our wonderful day today, which is so thought-provoking. Thank you again.